Before we start this chapter, we shall have a look into few keywords, so that you pay more attention to them when they come across. At the end of this chapter, you shall be in a position to remember these keywords. These are the keywords. Please read them on your own, and please pay more attention whenever they appear during the lecture. In this lecture, we are going to see static testing basics and we'll cover the overview of static testing. There are three learning objectives in this session. First, recognize types of software work product that can be examined by the different static testing techniques. Second, use examples to describe the value of static testing. And third, explain the difference between static and dynamic techniques considering objectives, types of defects to be identified, and the role of these techniques within the software lifecycle. First, understand what is static testing. Testing a work product without the work product being executed. Let's see a very simple example. Suppose this is a requirement. Light shall glow red once sensor detect 150 km per hour. I'm sure you found the defect in the requirement. First, spelling of sensor is wrong, and unit of temperature is mentioned as kilometer per hour instead of degree. We found these defects just by reading requirement. Such type of testing is called static testing and is defined as testing a work product without the work product being executed. We can perform static testing in two ways. And the two different ways are manual examination and tool-driven evaluation. Example of manual evaluation is reviews and tool-driven evaluation is static analysis. We saw this example where we read the requirement and found few mistakes. We did it manually and this type of static testing is called review. Whereas if there is a software which can find spelling mistakes and provide the report directly, then such testing is called tool-driven examination because tool helped us to find the mistake. This comes under static analysis. So with this example, it's clear that we can perform static testing in two ways, by reviewing the work product, which is manual examination, or by static analysis, which is tool-driven examination. Static analysis is important for the safety of critical computer systems, for example, aviation, medical, or nuclear software, and etc. Second example is security testing, like in banking domain. And the last point is static analysis is also often incorporated into automated software, build, and distribution tools, for example, in agile development, continuous delivery, and continuous deployment. In this lecture, we will list down all the work products which can be examined by the static testing. With this, we will address the first learning objective of this lesson. That is, recognize types of software work product that can be examined by the different static testing techniques. It is marked as K1, so you need to just remember the name of work products. Before we start, remember this. Any work product can be examined using static testing. These are the different work products which we are going to discuss here. Few of them you already know, and few are new here. For the new terms, we will see short description. First work product is specifications, including business requirements, functional requirements, and security requirements. Let's see definition of each item. Business requirements describe the characteristics of a proposed system from the viewpoint of the system's end user. It is a high-level requirement 
from the point of view of user. Functional requirement that specifies a function that a component or system must be able to perform. It is a low-level requirement for the technical team to implement. A security requirement is a security feature required by system users or a quality the system must possess to increase the user's trust in the system they use. This is the first work product specifications, including business requirements, functional requirements, and security requirements. Now let's move to the second work product, which is EPICS, User Stories, and Acceptance Criteria. Let's see definition of each item. An EPIC is one big piece of product functionality. Usually, it is too big to be completed in one sprint and should be split up into smaller bodies of work. I will explain this once we cover user story definition. A user story is a specific task within an EPIC. A user story is the smallest unit of work in an Agile framework. Now let's understand what is EPIC and user story with the help of an example. Consider registration and authentication is an EPIC. That means it refers to all types of registration and authentication possible by the software. It is a big functionality, so when we move to user story, we divide it for an example. Sign up with email, sign up with Facebook, log in with email, log in with Facebook, forgot password, and log out. These are all the small functionality within EPIC. Last point is acceptance criteria. Acceptance criteria are the conditions that a software product must meet to be accepted by a user, a customer, or other system. They are unique for each user's story and define the feature behavior from the end user's perspective. Next work product is architecture, design specifications, and code. Let's see definition of each item. Software architecture is the defining and structuring of a solution that meets technical and operational requirements. Software architecture optimizes attributes involving a series of decisions, such as security, performance, and manageability. A design specification is a document prepared by the client that details the specific requirements of the project. It is based on geotechnical information, piping requirements, and permissible methods and means for the execution of the work. Code is the set of instructions forming a computer program which is executed by a computer. This was the third and fourth work product. Fifth work is testware including test plans, test cases, test procedures, and automated test scripts. We discussed a lot about this in previous chapters, that's why I'm not explaining it here. Next is user guide. A user guide is essentially a book-length document containing instructions on installing, using, or troubleshooting a hardware or software product. For an example, when we get a washing machine, along with it, you also get a user guide where it's mentioned how to use the machine. Next is web page. Everyone knows what are web pages. Next is contracts, project plans, schedules, and budget planning. These terms are self explanatory. Next is configuration setup and infrastructure setup. These are the documents which explain. What are the different configurations available in the software? Last one is models. Let's see this picture from the MATLAB Simulink model. Such models also can be reviewed. All these documents can be reviewed and mistakes in them can be found by the static testing. Let's go through each work product again so that we can remember them. Specifications, including business requirements, functional requirements, and security requirements. Epics, user stories, and acceptance criteria. Architecture and design specifications. 
code, testware including test plans, test cases, test procedures, and automated test scripts, user guides, web pages, contracts, project plans, schedules, and budget planning, configuration setup and infrastructure setup, models such as activity diagrams. In this lecture, we will come to know the benefits of static testing. With this topic, we will cover the second objective of static testing, that is, use examples to describe the value of static testing. And this topic is marked as K2, so you must understand this topic. First, let's see an important point about static testing. When applied early in the software development lifecycle, static testing enables the early detection of defects. Now let's understand the meaning of that statement. This is a V model. Left side of it is a development phase, and right side is the testing activity. Very first input to this V model is the user requirement. Suppose there was a mistake in the user requirement, but it was not found in this stage, since static testing was not done. Then, based on the wrong user requirement, we will develop wrong system requirement, global design and detail design. And due to this, software will be implemented and complete testing will be done on it. Now, suppose, at the acceptance testing stage, the mistake was found. Since the error is found at this stage now, we need to change all these documents. But if we would have performed static testing, this error could have been found at the early stage, and we could have saved lots of effort and cost. We also saw this graph during principle of testing, where it was evident that more late we find the defect, more expensive it is. And static testing helps in this case. That's why we say, when static testing is applied early in the software development life cycle, static testing enables the early detection of defects. There are a few more benefits of static testing. First one is detecting and correcting defects more efficiently and prior to dynamic test execution. We know that dynamic testing can only be done after the code is implemented. For all the previous stages, only static testing can be performed to detect and correct defects more efficiently. Next benefit is identifying defects which are not easily found by dynamic testing. For example, in this requirement, there is a spelling mistake which we cannot find in the dynamic testing. Next benefit is preventing defects in design or coding by uncovering inconsistencies ambiguities, contradictions, omissions, inaccuracies, and redundancies in requirements. Here, if we focus on design stage or coding, then if we perform static testing at this stage, we can find defects related to inconsistencies, ambiguities, contradictions, omissions, inaccuracies, and redundancies in requirements. Next point is increasing development productivity. If we perform testing in the early stage, then we can avoid the defect multiplication and it will reduce the defect fix cycle. And this is the reason static testing increases development productivity. Next benefit of static testing is reduced development and testing cost and time. With this graph, it is clear that the earlier you find the defect, the less costly it will be to fix. And with static testing, we can find the defect early, and that is why it helps in reducing development and testing cost and time. Similar to this are the next two points. Reducing total cost of quality over the software's lifetime due to fewer failures later in the life cycle or after delivery into operation. And last point is improving communication between team members in the course of participation in reviews. Since during static testing we perform reviews, then we discuss it with the team. Due to this, it increases the communication within the team.
Let's have a look into all the points. Detecting and correcting defects more efficiently and prior to dynamic test execution. Identifying defects which are not easily found by dynamic testing. Preventing defects in design or coding by uncovering inconsistencies, ambiguities, contradictions, omissions, inaccuracies, and redundancies in requirements. Increasing development productivity, for example, due to improved design, more maintainable code. Reducing development cost and time. Reducing testing cost and time. Reducing total cost of quality over the software's lifetime due to fewer failures later in the life cycle or after delivery into operation. Improving communication between team members in the course of participating in reviews. Here we will see the difference between static testing and dynamic testing. And with this we will address the third objective. Explain the difference between static and dynamic techniques, considering objective types of defects to be identified, and the role of these techniques within the software life cycle. This is a very important topic, and it is marked as K2. When we talk about static testing and dynamic testing, there are two important points which we shall know. First point is static testing and dynamic testing have same objective, that is, finding defect. And type of testing you perform, the main objective is to find defect. But what you need to keep in mind is different testing finds different types of defect. For example, during static testing, we can find spelling mistakes and violation of coding guidelines, which we cannot find during dynamic testing. But during dynamic testing, we can find defects related to functionality, which we may not find during static testing. That is why you need to remember that objectives of static testing and dynamic testing are the same, but they find different defects. We already covered difference between static testing and dynamic. I hope you still remember these points. Here, I will quickly go through it. The first point is static testing is conducted without execution of code. Dynamic testing requires execution of code. The second point is static testing can be used to improve the consistency and internal quality of work products, while dynamic testing typically focuses on externally visible behaviors. The third point is static testing is cost-effective, while dynamic testing is less cost-effective. Fourth point is about examples. Static testing examples are walkthroughs and code reviews, whereas with dynamic testing, you have to perform functional or non-functional tests. Before we look into the example of static testing, let's have a look into this picture. We already know that static testing is performed before the code is implemented, and if found the defects before dynamic testing, it takes less effort and less cost to fix them. Now let's see the different types of defects which static testing can find effectively. First defect is requirement related. For an example, consistencies, ambiguities, contradictions, omissions, inaccuracies, and redundancies in the requirement. Second is design related. For an example, efficient algorithms or database structures, high coupling, and low cohesion. High coupling would mean that your module knows way too much about the inner workings of other modules. Modules that know too much about other modules make changes hard to coordinate and make modules brittle. Low cohesion is associated with undesirable traits such as being difficult to maintain, test, reuse, or even understand. Meaning of high coupling and low cohesion is not important, but it is important to know that these terms are related to static testing and they are design defects. Third is coding defects. Example of coding defects are variables with undefined values, variables that are declared but never used, unreachable code, and duplicate code. Main focus of static testing is to find such defects because these defects cannot be found in dynamic testing. For example, unreachable code and variables which are defined and not used occupies memory and may result in slow performance. Next is deviations from standards. Example is lack of adherence to coding standards. 
In static testing, we can easily find these defects. For example, for C coding, we have MISRA guideline. So we check code with respect to MISRA guideline. If we find any deviation, we report it. Next is incorrect interface specifications. For example, different units of measurements are used by the calling system than by the called system. Suppose the calling function is providing temperature value in Kelvin, but the called function is expecting temperature unit in degree. Such type of issue we can find using static testing. Next is security vulnerabilities. For example, susceptibility to buffer overflows. This point is very important. Just remember, the buffer overflow can be detected by static testing. Last point is inaccuracies traceability, like missing tests for an acceptance criteria. We know that we have to provide the traceability for all our work products. If we missed any, like or if we linked them incorrectly, we can find such thing in static testing. This topic is very important. You have to remember these defect types and their examples. In this lecture, we will see overview of review process. Let's first understand what is a review. Review is a type of static testing in which a work product or process is evaluated by one or more individuals to detect defects or to provide improvements. For an example, in requirement stage, requirement is our work product, so we have to evaluate it to find defects. By doing this, we improve the work product. After definition, what we need to know is review activity varies from informal review type to formal review type. When we say informal review, it is clear that we are not following a defined process and we do not document output formally. Now let's move to formal review. Here, the team formally participates in the review process. Their roles are assigned. The review result is formally documented, and along with that, in formal review, we also document which process we followed during the review. So what you need to remember is an informal review, result and process is not documented, whereas in formal review, result and process of review are documented. We learned that review can be a formal and informal type. Now the question is how to select the review process. There are five factors based on which we decide how formal our review will be. First factor is software development lifecycle model. Let's see two development models, incremental model and iterative model. In iterative model, sometimes we go for the informal review process because the software undergoes a lot of changes in each iteration, performing formal review process will be costly. Second point is the maturity of the development process. Let's take incremental model for explanation. If it's the first time when we are following this process, then it makes more sense to go for the formal review process. Because if we find more defects in the starting and document it, we will help in the future to not repeat such mistakes. Third point is the complexity of the work product to be reviewed. If the code is too complex, then it's better to go for formal review process so that we can document the result of the finding. Formal review brings review meeting into picture, where the responsible people discuss the code and each team member comes to the common understanding. Now, let's move to fourth point, legal or regulatory requirements. If the product needs to fulfill legal requirements, then in future, you may have to show proof that you followed all the process during development. To do that, we have to go for formal review. Last point is for an audit trail. After factors influencing review, now let's see the focus of review. First point is finding defect. Yes, the prime objective of review is to find defect in the work product. Second point is gaining understanding. And third point is educating participants. Let's see how. During review process, Review meeting is conducted, where all the stockholders are present and the team discuss the review item. 
By doing this, we increase the understanding of each team member. This will also help new team members to get into the topic. That's why review help in gaining understanding and educating participants. Last point is discussing and deciding by consensus. During review meeting, people come up with their own ideas and they discuss about it. And once everyone agrees to it, they finalize the idea. In-depth explanation of the review process is available in ISO IEC 20246. These are the different learning objectives of this topic. First topic is summarize the activities of the work product review process. Under this topic, we will see the different activities of review. Second topic is recognize the different roles and responsibilities in a formal review. Here, we will establish the role of people in review process. Third topic is explain the differences between different review types, informal review, walkthrough, technical review, and inspection. Here, we will see different types of review and their difference. Fourth topic is very important because it is marked as K3. Here, you need to apply a review technique to a work product to find defects. We will provide you a practical example showing how to perform review on a test object. At the end, we will explain the factors that contribute to a successful review. In this lecture, we will start with work product review process. Here, we will address the first learning objective, that is summarize the activities of the work product review process, and it is marked as K2. First, we will see different activities of review process, and then I will provide you detailed explanation of each activity. Review process starts with planning. Once planning is done, we initiate the review process. After that, the team member reviews the work product. After that, if team members find any defects, then they communicate it to the responsible person. An analysis of the defect starts. Once team member comes to the conclusion that the found defect needs a fix, then the issue is reported and fixed. So these are five activities of review process. Planning, initiate review, individual review, issue communication, and analysis, and at the end, fixing and reporting. Remember each activities in the same order. Now we will explain each activity in details. First, we will explain planning activity. During test planning, we define the scope of review. For example, we define the purpose of the review, we identify what documents to review, and we also identify the quality characteristics to be evaluated. Next, we estimate effort and time frame. During test planning, we estimate the complete effort required for review, and along with that, we decide when Review will start and when it will end. Third point is identifying review characteristic. During review planning, we decide whether we will go for informal review type or for formal review type and what all points we will collect for documentation after analyzing the product. Next in review planning, we select the people to participate in the review. In the review planning, we analyze the complexity of the work product, and based on that, the technical person is identified to review the selected work product. Fifth point is defining the entry and exit criteria. Here, entry criteria means necessary documents required to start a review, and exit criteria means making a report as defined in the planning stage. Before starting review, one has to make sure that all the documents are available, and once the review is done, they have to ensure that all the necessary data is collected and documented. Last point is similar to the previous point, checking that entry criteria are met. One has to make sure that the entry criteria are met before starting the review. So these were the tasks we need to perform in review planning stage, defining the scope, 
estimating effort and time frame, identifying review characteristics, selecting the people to participate in the review, defining the entry and exit criteria, and checking that entry criteria are met. Now I will explain review initiations process in detail. First task is to provide work product, log sheet, and checklists. Let's understand this point. Before we start review, the work product is given to the team member. Along with the work product, defect log sheet and checklist is provided. In the next activity, I will explain the use of log sheet and checklist. For now, remember, work product, log sheet, and checklists are provided in the initiation stage. Next point is that in the review initiation stage, the scope, objectives, process, roles, and work products are explained to the participants. Here, before the team members start review on work product, we explain the scope of review, which type of review they need to perform, what role they are going to perform in whole review process, and also a short description of work product is given. And the last point is answering any questions that participants may have about the review. During this meeting, if team member has any doubts regarding the review process, its scope, or about the work product, they can ask it here. So these are the three tasks we perform during review initiation. Distributing the work log forms, checklists, and related work products. Explaining the scope, objectives, process, roles, and work products to the participants. Answering any questions that participants may have about the review. Now let's move to the third activity, individual review. This is the place where review of all or part of the work product takes place. Let's see an example here. As we saw previously, we get work product, log sheet, and checklist for review activity. Checklist contains questions which reviewer reads and checks the work product against that. If work product violates that question, then defect is logged in the log sheet. Question could be, are all the words spelled correctly? Then reviewer has to review the document for the spelling. If he finds wrong spelling, then it is a defect and document it in the log sheet. With this, we also covered second point, noting potential defects, recommendations, and questions. So here, in addition to defect, we can also enter our recommendation and question in the log sheet. After performing the review on work product, we move to issue communication and analysis. From name itself, we can understand that in this stage, we communicate identified potential defects to the team member. In this stage, the reviewer, after completing the review call for a meeting, where all the stockholders of the product are there. In this meeting, the reviewer communicates the potential defect with the team member. Pay attention to the word potential defects. We are saying found defects are potential defects because they are not yet finalized. They will be finalized after the analysis, which is our next point. Analyzing potential defects, assigning ownership and status to them. Here, after analysis, we confirm the defect or we reject the defect. After confirming the defect, we assign the owner of that defect so the defect can be fixed. And we also assign status to the defect like open, in progress, or closed. Next point is evaluating and documenting quality characteristic. Here, along with communicating and analyzing the defect, we evaluate it and document the quality characteristic. For an example, we evaluate how many spelling errors were there. Likewise, we collect other quality characteristics. This data is then used as a matrix during improvement meeting. We analyze these data and try to find out which types of defects are more in the document and what type of training we can provide to the team member so that these defects can be minimized. And the last point is evaluating the review findings against the exit criteria. Let's understand this. In the planning stage, we define the exit criteria. The exit criteria could be to assign some labels to the found defects, like reject, major changes needed, 
except possibly with minor changes. So these are the tasks we perform under issue communication and analysis stage. Communicating identified potential defects, analyzing potential defects, assigning ownership and status to them, evaluating and documenting quality characteristics, evaluating the review findings against the exit criteria to make a review decision. After communicating and analyzing the defects, we need to fix the defect and make final defect report. First point is creating defect reports for those findings that require changes to a work product. From the last stage, we got the list of all the defects. Now here, we create defect report only for those findings which require change to the work product in this release. And then comes the next point. Fixing defects found in the work product reviewed. Now, whichever defect is applicable for this release, we need to fix them. While fixing defect, if we find that the mentioned defect is due to the other module, then we communicate the defect to appropriate person or team who is responsible for that module. This is the third point, communicating defects to the appropriate person or team. Many team initially, we felt that the defect belongs to one module, but while fixing the defect, we find the cause of the defect is other module. And at that point of time, we communicate the defect to the responsible person. Next point is recording updated status of the defect. Once the defect is fixed, we need to change its status from in progress to closed, so that one can know how many defects are open and how many are closed. Next point is gathering metrics, and this stage we also gather matrix like how many defects are still open, how many major defects are open. Once we gather the matrices, we move to the next point. That is checking the exit criteria are met. For an example, exit criteria could mean that no major defect shall be in open stage from the matrices we will come to know that if we have any major open defect, after performing this check, we decide whether to accept the work product or not. This is the next point, accepting the work product when the exit criteria are reached. You can see that how each points are related to each other. So these were the different tasks under fixing and reporting stage. Creating defect reports for those findings that require changes to a work product, fixing defects found in the work product reviewed, communicating defects to the appropriate person or team, recording updated status of defects potentially including the agreement of the comment originator, gathering matrix, checking that exit criteria are met, accepting the work product when the exit criteria are reached. Before we end this lecture, remember that these are the different activities of review process. planning initiate review, individual review, issue communication and analysis, and fixing and reporting. In this lecture, we will discuss about roles and responsibilities in a formal review. And here, we will address the second learning objective. Recognize the different roles and responsibilities in a formal review. It is marked as K1. So you just need to remember this topic. In the review process, different people play different roles. Let's first see what are the different roles we have in review process. Then we will see them in detail. First comes the author, then management, facilitator, review leader, reviewer, and the last one is scribe or sometimes called as recorder. You need to remember all these names. Now let's see the main responsibility of each of these people. Author is the person who creates the work product, which undergoes review process. Management is responsible for planning review process. The role of facilitator is to run the review meeting smoothly. Review leader is responsible for the overall review process. Reviewer is the person who reviews the work product to find defects. Remember, this author creates the work product and reviewer reviews the work product. And scribe records the defects found by the reviewer. 
This was the short overview of responsibilities. Now let's see each responsibility in detail. First is the author. Author creates the work product under review. Let's see this. If you are in the requirements stage, the work product is requirement. So the person who wrote the requirement is the author of the requirement work product. Similarly, if you are in implementation stage, the person who writes the code is the author. And the next responsibility of the author is to fix the defects found in his module. Since author is the person who creates the work product, if reviewers find defect in it, then it is more efficient that the person who developed this work product fix the defect found in it, as author already knows the work product. Responsibility of the author is simple. Create the work product and fix the defects found in it. Now let's see what is the responsibility of management. Management is responsible for review planning. We already saw what all tasks we perform in review planning stage. Management is responsible for all of them. Defining scope, estimating effort, identifying review characteristics, selecting people, defining and checking entry and exit criteria. Next responsibility is to decide on the execution of the review. Management decided in which phase of the development model we will perform review activity. Next, they assign the staff budget and time. Here, they are allocating the resources and scheduling the review activity. Next, management monitors ongoing cost effectiveness. Here, the management is looking if review added any benefits to the project or not. In terms of effort and benefits, they try to analyze if we are able to find potential defect in the same stage where defect is introduced or not. Last point is executes control decisions in the event of inadequate outcomes. This step is similar to monitoring and control activity. Here, management monitors the review process, and if required, they allocate more resources or prove more time to complete the review process on time. These were the responsibilities of management. Responsible for review planning, decides on the execution of reviews, assigns staff budget and time, monitors ongoing cost effectiveness, executes control decisions in the event of inadequate outcomes. After author, management, now let's see responsibilities of facilitator. Facilitator is a person who is responsible for effective running of meeting. Facilitator makes sure that the review meeting is going in correct direction, makes sure there is no conflict arise between reviewer and author. Facilitator acts as a mediator, if necessary, between the various points of review. That's why we can say often the success of the review depends on the facilitator. These are responsibilities of the facilitator. Ensures effective running of the review meetings, mediates if necessary between the various points of view, is often the person upon whom the success of the review depends. Next is review leader. Review leader takes the overall responsibility for the review. Review leader decides who will be involved in the review process and where review will take place. This point is very important for review leader. Decides who will be involved and organizes when and where it will take place. Next, we will see the responsibility of the reviewer. First, let's see who can be the reviewer. Subject matter experts, persons working on the project, can become reviewers. Even stakeholders with an interest in the work product can become reviewers. And any individual with specific technical or business backgrounds can become a reviewer. And the role of reviewer is to identify potential defects in the work product under review. Since reviewers are the experts in the topic, they have the responsibility to find the defects. Along with finding defect, reviewer may present different perspectives to the implementation. Since they are the expert, they can suggest improvement points to improve the quality of the software. Let's revise the points quickly. Maybe subject matter experts, persons working on the project, stakeholders with an interest in the work product, and or individuals with specific technical or business backgrounds. Identify potential defects in the work product under review may represent different perspectives. And 
finally, we will see responsibility of Scribe. And the points are very simple. Scribe collates potential defects found during the individual review activity and records new potential defects, open points, and decisions from the review meeting. If you want to know more about the roles and responsibilities of review process, then you can have a look into ISO IEC 20246 standard. We will end this lecture with this information. Author creates work product. Management plans review. Facilitator runs review meeting. Review leader is responsible for review. Reviewer identifies defects in work product. And Scribe records defect. In this lecture, we will cover different types of review. With this, we will cover the third topic. Explain the differences between different review types, informal review, walkthrough, technical review, and inspection. Before going to each review types, you must know that all review types have common objective, that is to detect defect. Now the question is, why we have different review types to achieve same objectives? Because each project has different needs, different types of resource are available for different types of project. Next is product type and risk. Different product has different types of risk associated with them, and to address them effectively, we need different review types. Similar to different project and different product, we may have different business domain, and to address their need cost effectively, we need different review types. And the last one is company culture. Some company focus on very high quality of their product, whereas some company looks for more profit. Each company has their own cultures, and to fulfill that, we have different review types. So review type selection is based on needs of the project, available resources, product type and risk, business domain, and company culture. We can apply more than one review type to the same work product. For an example, initially we can apply informal review type on a work product and then we can apply technical review on it. But the question is, why do we need to do informal review before technical review? This is to ensure the work product is ready for a technical review. Now let's start with different types of review. We have four types of review informal review, walkthrough, technical review, and inspection. First, let's understand what is the main purpose of these review types. These are the four review types, and these are the main purposes. Main purpose of informal review is to detect potential defects in the work product. Since it's the informal type of review, we don't focus on much of documentation. We focus on finding defects. Next is walkthrough. This review type is more formal than the previous review type, and its main purpose is to find defect. Along with that, it focuses on improving the software product. We focus on alternative implementation of code and evaluate conformance to standard and specification. We already know that finding defect is the common objective. That's why it's also here, but other points are specific to this review type, and you shall remember them. We focus on improving software by providing alternative ways of implementation, and here we also see that the standards are met or not. These points are unique to this review type only. Next is technical review. One of the main purposes is detecting potential defect but the other main purpose is to gain consensus. During technical review, we discuss with the team member and we try to come on the same page for the technical solution of implementation. To build an algorithm, there can be multiple ways. Here, we try to choose the best one for our project. So gaining consensus is the unique point of technical review. Last one is the inspection. This is the most formal review technique among all. And the main purpose is to detect potential defect, 
evaluate quality and building confidence in the work product, preventing future similar defects through author learning and root cause analysis. We have many unique points for inspection, like evaluating quality. Since it is formal review type, we collect all the matrices which help us to evaluate quality. And by evaluating if we see the matrix is positive, then we will build confidence in the work product. For example, if we don't get any major review defect, that means the quality of the work product is good. From the matrix, we will also come to know which types of defects were found most. Then, we will arrange a training program for author to improve their skills, and by doing this, we avoid the similar defects in the future. So these were the main purposes of four review types. Let's go through the unique points of each review type. Informal review, detect potential defect. Walkthrough, improve software quality, consider alternative implementation, evaluate conformance to standard and specification. Technical review, gaining consensus. Inspection, evaluating quality and building confidence in the work product, preventing future similar defects, training author and root cause analysis. Along with the main purpose, we also need to know the additional purpose, which we will see here. It is very simple to remember additional purpose if you know the main purpose properly. Let's see the trick. Additionally, purpose will contain point from the main purpose of the next review type. For an example, if you want to know the additional purpose of informal review, then you can get it from main purpose of walkthrough. Let's see how. Main purpose of walkthrough is to provide alternative implementation, and the additional purpose of informal review is generating new idea or solution, which is same as providing alternative implementation. We will see this similarity with all the review types. Other purpose of informal review is quickly solving minor problems. Since we don't prepare many documents here, the process is fast comparing to the other review types. Next is walkthrough. Here, the additional purpose is to exchange ideas about technique or style, training of participant, and achieving consensus. Don't get confused as gaining consensus is the main purpose of the technical review. Here again, main purpose of technical review became additional purpose of the walkthrough. In informal review, along with finding defect, we can generate new ideas or solutions, quickly solving minor problems, since we do not document much here, finding and fixing defect is quite fast comparing to the other review types. In walkthrough, we can exchange idea about techniques or style. We can also perform training of participants and achieve consensus. Now don't get confused with main purpose. For an example, gaining consensus is the main purpose of technical review. But in walkthrough, along with main purpose, if team wants to achieve this, they can do it. They have to fulfill the main purpose. This is additional to it. So don't get confused with main purpose and additional purpose. Next is technical review. Evaluating quality and building confidence in the work product, generating new ideas, motivating and enabling authors to improve future work products, considering alternative implementations. Here, evaluating quality and building confidence in the work product, generating new ideas, motivating and enabling authors to improve future work products, is the main purpose of inspection and additional purpose of technical review. The last one is inspection, and its additional purpose is motivating and enabling authors to improve future work products and the software development process, achieving consensus. Let's go through them quickly. Informal review. Generating new ideas or solutions quickly, solving minor problems. Walkthrough. Exchanging ideas about techniques or style variations. Training of participants, achieving consensus. Technical review. Evaluating quality and building confidence in the work product. Generating new ideas. Motivating and enabling authors to improve future work products. Considering alternative implementations. Inspection. Motivating and enabling authors to improve future work products and the software development process, achieving consensus. Now we will see few differences between all the review types. 
With this table, it will be easy for you to remember all the points. Here we have review types, and here we have some attributes which you shall keep in mind. First attribute is individual preparation. In informal review, we don't do it. In walkthrough, it is optional. In technical review, it is mandatory. And in inspection, also it is mandatory. Next is review meeting. In informal review, we don't conduct review meeting. In walkthrough, we conduct review meeting. And what you need to remember is this meeting is led by the author. In technical review, it's optional. If it is conducted, then it will be led by the trained facilitator. And in inspection, it's mandatory. And here, also, it's conducted by the trained facilitator. Next is involvement of scribe in review process. For informal review, we don't include scribe. For walkthrough, technical review and inspection, we include scribe. Next point is use of checklist. In informal review, we don't use the checklist. For walkthrough and technical review, it's optional. And for inspection, it is mandatory. Next two points are for defect log and review report. They're optional for informal review and mandatory for all other review types. With this table, it's easy to remember these points. All the points are mandatory for inspection. First four points are not required for informal review, and last one is optional. For technical reviews, yes, and optional are alternative. One last point which you shall remember is that matrices are collected in inspection stage, but it is not done in any other stage. We tried our best to simplify this topic. Hope it will help you. After covering review activities and review types, now we will have a look into review techniques. With this, we will cover fourth topic of this chapter, that is apply a review technique to a work product to find defects. This topic is marked as K3. That means you will get an application-based question from this topic. Five review techniques which we're going to study in this lecture are ad hoc, checklist based, scenarios and dry runs, perspective based, and role based. Let's start with the first review technique, ad hoc. In this review technique, the reviewer is provided with little or no guidance on how this task should be performed. Reviewer, based on his experience and skill, reviews the document and documents the issue as and when he encounters them. This is the next point, documenting issues as they are encountered. This revive technique required very less preparation time, since the reviewer is not provided with the guideline. He doesn't have to prepare any documents, results in less preparation time. Next, this technique is highly dependent on reviewer skills. Since no guideline is provided, the success of review completely depends on the knowledge and skill of the reviewer. But this type of review can result in duplicated issues. If more than one reviewer is involved in review, then due to absence of guideline to them, they may find the same defect and result in duplicated defect. Let's see an example of ad hoc review technique. Suppose you are a reviewer. Now someone gives you this document to review without any guideline. So now, based on your experience and skill, you will find the defect in this requirement. This is how ad hoc review is performed. We will not go through the requirement as it is not required. Next is checklist-based review. This is a systematic review technique where the review is based on the checklist. I hope you still remember. Review checklist is provided during the initiate review stage of the review process. After getting the checklist, the reviewer goes through it and prepares for the review. And the main advantage of the checklist-based technique is a systematic coverage of typical defect types. Since the review is based on checklist, we can find the defects we are looking for. But what you need to remember is we shall not restrict ourselves to the checklist. Checklist is provided to make the review process more focused. You should also look for different types of defects based on your own experience and skills. 
For an example, let's see this requirement again. Now, if you are a reviewer, then this time along with the requirement, a checklist will be given to you like this one. This checklist will contain some questions. Based on this, you will perform the review. So this is how we perform checklist-based review. Next is scenarios and dry runs review technique. This review technique is similar to the checklist-based. In checklist-based, the reviewer gets the checklist against which he performs the review. First point is reviewers are provided with structured guidelines on how to read through the work product. In scenario-based review technique, reviewer is provided with scenarios instead of a checklist. Scenarios describe where the work product will be used and what is its purpose. Second point. A scenario-based review supports reviewers in performing dry runs on the work product based on expected usage of the work product. Since it is provided where and how the work product will be used, the reviewer reviews the document with certain mindset, keeping the usage of the work product. Last point is the scenarios provide reviewers with better guidelines on how to identify specific defect types than simple checklist entries. Here, after getting the scenarios, the reviewer analyzes it and lists down the different risks or he tries to find out scenarios where function may fail. And then he looks for its solution in the work product. By doing this, he looks for the specific defect. Next is the perspective-based review technique. Here, the reviewers take on different stakeholder viewpoints in individual reviewing. Here, the reviewers act like a stakeholder and try to review the document from the stakeholder's point of view. When we say stakeholder's point of view, then it includes end user, marketing, designer, tester, or operations. Here, reviewer has to think how the end user will use the work product or how the marketing team or designer will use this work product how this work product will work in operational use. And he may also think how the tester will test this work product. Keeping all these viewpoints, he has to review the work product. When reviewer reviews from the point of view of stakeholder, it leads to more depth in individual reviewing with less duplication of issues across reviewers. Before we go to the next review technique, you must know that this is the most effective way of reviewing the document. Last review technique is role-based. This review technique is similar to that of perspective-based. Only difference is reviewers evaluate the work product from the perspective of individual stakeholder role. And here, the reviewer can play role of experienced person, inexperienced person, senior, or a child. In this lecture, we saw five different types of review techniques, ad hoc, checklist based, scenarios and dry runs, perspective based and role based. In this lecture, we will address success factors for reviews. This is the last learning objective of this chapter, where we will explain the factors that contribute to a successful review. We will discuss two factors which can contribute to the success of review. First one is organizational factor and second one is individual factor. Let's start with the organizational factors. Here, I will just go through the points as they are self-explanatory and simple. Now, let's see the factors one by one. Each review has clear objectives defined during review planning and used as measurable exit criteria. Review types are applied, which are suitable to achieve the objectives and are appropriate to the type and level of software work products and participants. Any review techniques used, such as checklist-based or role-based reviewing, are suitable for effective defect identification in the work product to be reviewed. Any checklists used address the main risks and are up to date. Large documents are written and reviewed in small chunks, 
so that quality control is exercised by providing authors early and frequent feedback on defects. Participants have adequate time to prepare. Reviews are scheduled with adequate notice. Management supports the review process. Reviews are integrated in the company's quality and or test policies. Next, we will go through the individual factors one by one. The right people are involved to meet the review objectives. For example, people with different skill sets or perspectives who may use the document as a work input. Testers are seen as valued reviewers who contribute to the review and learn about the work product, which enables them to prepare more effective tests and to prepare those tests earlier. Participants dedicate adequate time and attention to detail. Reviews are conducted on small chunks so that reviewers do not lose concentration during individual review and or the review meeting when held. Defects found are acknowledged, appreciated and handled objectively. The meeting is well managed so that participants consider it a valuable use of their time. The review is conducted in an atmosphere of trust. The outcome will not be used for the evaluation of the participants. Participants avoid body language and behaviors that might indicate boredom, exasperation, or hostility to other participants. Adequate training is provided, especially for more formal review types, such as inspections. A culture of learning and process improvement is promoted. Here, you don't have to remember each point. Just with basic common sense, you can easily figure out the factor is from organizational factor or from individual factors. Go through the points twice or thrice until you get the clear picture.